Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us, Father. Our cups really do runneth over. Father, we know that we live in a world that, that's, that's uh, going in the wrong direction. But Father, you have told us many times, and we're, we're learning this, if we haven't learned it already, that we are to live in this world, yes, but not to be a part of it. We're not to associate with those things that are that's detrimental to thy word. And I pray that you continue to enlighten us and to strengthen us, Father, so that we may know and understand what we need to do and when we need to do it and stay patiently focused, Father. We also have these unspoken prayers before you at this time. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for <coughs> excuse me, answering them in perfect season. We also pray, dear Lord, for Heather, Isaiah, for Becca, for Olivia. We ask, dear Lord, on all these that you lead, that you guide, and for Jody, that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal in Yeshua's precious holy name. And as always, Father, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel that you watch over them. We pray, dear Lord, they're staying in thy word. They're staying focused and doing thy laws. And we pray, dear Lord, that they will return to the sheepfold soon. And as always, Father, we pray for Israel and for our nation, for thy kingdom to come. For it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, come, Lord, come. And Father, we always pray for those first responders every day. They're on the front lines doing thy work and we pray for their safety and we pray for our military who are in arms way or who are about to go into arms way for their safety and speedy return home and as always father we pray for the lost those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive that truth now father i pray that you open up our eyes that we may see pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written as it will be you that speaks to us this day in Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, we're getting back in our Father's Word. We're basically getting ready. We've, we've dealt with three churches now. Getting ready to go into the fourth. Um, but today, we're really going to be going into... I know I got my notes from, from long ago. But we're going to go a lot deeper than what I've got today. I've been led. I, I didn't get much sleep last night. The Lord had me really involved in some really cool revelation mm -hmm. of, of what we're dealing with today. But we know we're dealing with these churches, but we're going to put it in perspective today because really we've looked at the church is what the good things that they've did and the bad things that they've done. But let's put this in perspective. Knowing what we know about our Father's Word, when we're talking about churches, are we talking about a church structure with an assembly of God in the church? What are we really talking about when we're talking about the churches today. It's kind of like categories of people, groups of people. In this case, there's different types. Some of them are the same type, but... Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, because what... I mean, you have to ask yourself, what is a church? Mm -hmm. You know? And we, we, we've learned when, when Christ taught when he was walking this earth, when his, his apostles said, you know, when's the end going to come? And, and, and they say, look at all these, these wonderful buildings. They're talking about the temple. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? Well, I'm going to destroy this temple. And in three days, build it up, mm -hmm. build it again. And they didn't understand that, but they didn't understand he was talking about his church. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. And, and the fact is, so this, when we're, when we're looking at these different churches, these different bodies, 
we need to bring it to understanding with clarity that we're talking about, or better said, he's talking about his children and what they're doing and what they're not doing. Because after all, we, we've covered some of these churches now, and we'll, we'll cover more, and we'll cover one more today. But we're going to find out that, if we don't know already, that they all did good things. I mean, let's let's look at people today. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say, oh, they're all rotten. No, they're mm -hmm. not all rotten. You know, there are some good people. But there are also some good people that do bad things. You know, and this is what he's been showing us, that you can't have it both ways. You know, and this is what screws up a lot of people. They're trying to keep their old lifestyle intact to some degree, get rid of some things, but still keep this over here. Well, this over here might be against God's laws and God's teachings and God's ways, but they don't want to let go of that. Oh, they want to be a righteous, doing right kind of Christian, but they want to do it right their way instead of God's way. You know, And when that happened, and our, our Lord's teaching us here, look, these people had some really good stuff, but they brought in or kept some bad stuff. And he's told them, get rid of it. So, with that being said, let's continue our study in Revelation chapter 2, pick it up where we left off in verse 17. Now, really, verse 17 is really going to go in depth as far as God's elect is concerned. But with that being said, with wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, and it reads, He that hath an ear... Mm -hmm. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's not just the teacher or the preacher, but it's also the people, the body of Christ. To him that overcometh. Don't overlook that. To him that overcometh. Now what are we talking about? Overcoming what? This Flesh. world. <laughs> this world. Flesh. Flesh. Same thing. Overcome adversity. Overcoming false doctrine. I mean, haven't we all been in a position in life as we matured? I mean, did we start out as a meek Christian, as a God's election? Absolutely not. We started where? Where everybody starts, as a milk Christian. You know, we, we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, but we were so green and so naive about the way things were that we were basically gullible mm -hmm. to where these people would come in and we thought, hey, they're, they're preachers. They're the good old reverends. They're priests or whatever the case may be, whatever your theology was. And I'm going to listen to this person and, hey, they're the ones that's got the answers. <laughs> but we learned over a period of time that they're not the ones that have the answers. Our Father is the one, His Word, that has the answers. So as we matured and we grew in Christianity, we realized that some things just weren't as they appeared to be, that there was more information. That's why it says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Yeah. Well, what do you think that hidden manna is? His word. It's hidden? Well, if you don't ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and understanding, yes. Not just that. Remember how this book started. Very first verse in this book that you would not be able to understand the book of Revelation if you were not what? Servant. A servant. Yeah. A servant. You've got to serve the Lord with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Not be wishy-washy, but let's not forget something. This is very important to remember. All these churches that he did find fault with, guess what? They still have their candlestick. The light has not been taken from them at that point. 
Why? How, how can I say that? Because he's telling them. He's writing a letter to them. And he's telling them, look, you know, I've, you know, you got all these good things, but I got something against you. So that tells us that even though they weren't doing right, they still had that candlestick up to a certain point. Now, what that point is that God finally removes that candlestick, that's between them and him. But let's put this in a personal perspective. When we're given information and, and we, we, we lived a certain lifestyle and we study the Word of God and we realize at that particular point that lifestyle may have gone against our Father. At that point, we have a choice. We can either continue the lifestyle and try to walk both sides of the fence or, as our Father said last week, repent and do what's right or else I will remove that candlestick. So in other words, that point is, is that when we know better, we've been given the information and we fail to do what's right, that's when that light will be removed from us. And it will be taken away from our understanding. And this hidden manna, it's not hidden to God's election. It's not hidden to those that want to study and do what's right and repent. Mm -hmm. It's hidden to those that won't. Yeah. It's hidden to those people that just, you know, they want to walk both sides of the fence. The world. They want to remain in the world or those of the world. Yeah. It reminded me of the employment thing that you were talking about. It's like a merit raise. The hidden manna. Your servant, you're doing what you're supposed to. You will receive it. If and it's like a job, like a review. Mm -hmm. Like you were talking about. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you a review. You got some good points. If you don't straighten up on these, though, you ain't going to get it. So. But what's cool about it, he tells you. Yeah. It's not that we are going through life fumbling around yeah. and not knowing better. Well, he you will tells you, you. You will if you don't read it and yeah. understand it. Study it. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between right. reading and studying. Because there's a lot of people just read over the well, Word of God. Well, I was just cracking the book open. I, I've, I've, I've seen lectures where they say, well, we're going to cover the book of Revelation the next two weeks. With and basically spent a total of one hour on the entire book of Revelation and covered the whole book yeah. in their opinion. Well, you don't get to read out of here. <laughs> According to them. Hit the but this hidden manna, and that hidden manna, that, do you realize that manna is still alive today? Yeah. And that manna is truth. The truth is alive and well today. But it's hidden to so many people because they refuse to do it God's way. But it goes deeper. Mm -hmm. And not only the hidden manna, mm -hmm. and will give him, and this is genderless, this is mankind, and will give him a white stone. Mm -hmm. A white stone. And in the stone, a new name written, mm -hmm. which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now, have you ever studied this white stone? Have you ever taken it back? Because you can take it back to, to in the Strongs and look it up. But I want, I want to make this simpler. Because I think I have it written down here somewhere. Let me go to like verse 17. Uh, oh. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9 also talks about this stone with 7,000 eyes. It's, a, it's, the same, it's the same thing. Hmm. But this stone, basically, you take it back, it, you take it back to its root word, it means count. Another place, it also means count the number of the beast. But I don't, I don't want to go in that direction. Yeah. But I've been led to talk about this, this, count, this stone. This stone is a smooth stone, and how it's become smooth it has been worn smooth over a long period of time. And what this means is that you're given this stone 
after a long period of time that you have been studying and devotional mm -hmm. to our Father. According to the um, companion, it says, a white stone was known to the ancients as a victory stone. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but the, the white stone, basically white meaning purity. Mm -hmm. And this stone, your name is placed upon that stone because you have become, at that point, an overcomer. Mm -hmm. Is that the new creation, the new man? or I would say so, because basically, remember, where are we? Let's not forget where we are at this point mm -hmm. in the matter of a time frame. Mm -hmm. Where was John? John was taken to heaven. In the millennial period. Mm -hmm. So this stone that is given to individuals with their name on it but guess what it's a new name yes what did Jesus do did did he rename everybody I think so no he didn't rename about the apostles when he said everybody yeah the thing is he all right let's let's pick the ones that he did rename why did he give them a new name I have to ask you well we're learning this now yeah this is part of the stone the, th the, th the fact of the matter is, Christ gave them a new name because that name meant something in the kingdom. Yes. Like Peter yes. meant rock. Yes. You know, nobody's going to go around everybody named Peter. They call him, hey, rock, how you doing? You know, they call him Peter. But see, Christ has a name that he gives his children, those that deserve it, those that work for it in this lifetime where they have not only been overcomers but they have been doers and that they've gone above and beyond what they've been called to do so Christ is giving them something very special here and it's called this white stone and it's almost you know you can almost look like I don't want to be facetious here but it's almost like a get in card you know, where they they say, well, who are you? Well, with my pass. <laughs> I got I got my pass. Mm -hmm. You know, I can go I can go into the holy of holies. You know, and um, this is this is what he's talking about. Well, let me here. see if your name's on the list. Yeah. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, it's on the, it's on the first page. <laughs> you know, it's on the first page. So this, and, but it says here, which no man knoweth, saving he. Why? Because it's it's personal. Has nothing to do with other people. Has to do with that individual alone. Yeah. Between them and the Lord. Mm -hmm. Why? Because see the Lord is the heart knower, so he knows. He knows what they've done or what they haven't done. He knows that they have overcome the adversities all from from the beginning to the end. In other words, all the way to the first earth heaven age even all the way through being born into the flesh and then rising above but this is also <coughs> where these people that have this stone that they're given have come to the understanding you about rip your page there oh. they've come to the understanding of the genealogy of things you know Christ genealogy Cain's genealogy you know uh, uh, Lucifer being the morning star, even though Christ is called the morning star, which we'll get to in a moment. You know, they have this knowledge, but it wasn't just zapped into their into their heads. They worked for it, and they actually deserve this white stone. It's a one big attaboy that Christ gives them for doing what they should have been doing. It also reminded me when he was when Jesus was talking about how the sheep know his master's voice. Mm -hmm. And so when you call that name, oh, I, it's a personal calling, a personal communication between you two also. It is a personal. But oh. but we got to understand, Ross, that there's a lot of people who have answered that call that are actually doing a lot of things for the Lord today. But these particular individuals 
go even above and beyond that. The way I look at it is that these people, it seems to me, I could be wrong, but I believe that these people are with the Lord 24-7. In other words, no matter what they're doing in life, they're doing to the Lord or for the Lord. Yes, we know that he's told us, you do for the least of these, you do for me. And, and there's a, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good works out there. However, these folks are persistent. Does that mean they can't fail? Everybody can fail. But the point is, they're quick to repent. I mean, it's almost instantaneous. Like if somebody does a flub up in a, you in know, a, in a, in a, maybe saying a cuss word real quick, you know, out of the blue because something really ticked them off. They're quick saying, oh, forgive me, Father. You know, that's not me. So, so these, these folks have really got it together. And these folks, let me tell you something, people go to. People go and ask questions of these folks in this life, in the flesh life. You know. So they, they, they receive all this. But let's not forget, to him that overcometh, which means all can achieve this. See, a lot of people say, because Christ came, Christ came to, to, uh, to show us the way, how to live and stuff. And a lot of people say, well, I couldn't be that way. Well, if, if that's your attitude, fine. That's how you want to be. If you want to say, well, I, I just can't be that righteous. Yes, you can. You can do what's right. You know, you can overcome. Our Father just said here, to those that did this, will receive this. So there are some that will be able to achieve this. Verse 18. Now we're getting into another church. Verse 18. And unto the angel, or the messenger of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. This is basically talking about his, that his feet are, uh, are 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 good to tread down with, to to. You mean like solid, like a solid base. Yeah, but he's trodden down basically that all that is evil, mm -hmm. and and the eyes that can see right to the very core of the soul. He's the heart knower. You know that's who Christ is. That's why he came. That's who why he is the way he is today. We can't con him. And, and and he's showing us in his word all these people that are doing all these good works. But he says, you know, notwithstanding or uh-oh, you know, I find fault with you. Listen, these things saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. 19, I know thy works. We could even say righteous acts here. And charity. What's charity? Love. Love. I, I know your love. These are, these are good qualities. And service. That means you serve him. I remember one time I was dealing with these Wiccans in our church. We were at uh, Shady, Acres. Shady Acres. We had a church there. And next to us there was these, these Wiccans. And we got to know them, and they were friendly people, but they wanted absolutely nothing to do with their father's work. And I remember they came in the chapel one day, and I was talking to them, and I, I, I don't remember where my thoughts were at that moment, but I remember looking to the one female, and I said, I am a slave for Christ. And... They were flabbergasted. How in the world could you be a slave for anybody? You know. To which I tried to elaborate about that at that point in life that 
my every fiber of being was to honor the Lord. You were talking to a deaf ear. Well, I understand, but I was, I was, uh, You're trying a to new, a new, uh, pastor, basically, in a new church, and trying to spread God's gospel wherever I could, no matter who it was. Yeah. But these folks here, they have good works, and they have love, and they serve the Lord. Let's not forget what they're doing. These, they're doing good quality things. And faith. they got faith. Good. That's pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And thy patience. Remember I told you we are going to talk about patience? The fact is, they have patience for what? For all things. They have patience with those that don't know the truth, that don't have the truth, that are n newcomers to the truth, and those that are, aren't quite getting it, but they have patience with them. And thy works, twice for emphasis. In other words, they've got righteous acts. They've got some good works. Mm -hmm. And, here it is, the last to be more than the first... They've got a deeper understanding that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Hmm. And we've studied that. Those that, that, that come upon this earth and those that are going through the uh, end generations are, and, and those that go to the kingdom are going to be first in that kingdom. Those that are remaining on this planet till the Lord comes are going to be last called. Simply put, the bottom line here is, is that they've got some really good information that they're producing in the church. They've got good works. 20, notwithstanding, here we go again. In other words, I know all this stuff that you're doing, all these good things. However, i got a problem. I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now, this isn't the same Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 16, but it is a type. Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 16 through 19, remember she had dealings with Elijah. And what did she lead at that point? She basically led the children away from God's truth and basically put up all these old uh, groves out in the forest. And basically what they were ended up being orgies. You know. Bell worship. Well, a form of it, but the, the fact is that they weren't doing God's work. That She was pulling people away from God. And uh, why would he call a church a Jezebel today? Well, let's find out. Which calleth herself a prophetess. Now notice it says, calls herself a prophetess. Mm -hmm. Meaning God didn't call her a prophetess. What's a prophetess? Teacher. A teacher. So she was calling herself a teacher. But the point is, she called herself a teacher, not God. Which means her instructions did not come from God. Well, where did her instructions come from? From mankind. From the world. And who runs the world? Is, is God running the world today? Obama. Has God run the world for as long as we can remember? If God has been running the world, wouldn't everything be peachy keen? So who's running the world? Who's the prince of the air, as the word calls him? Satan. Satan. So, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach, here's what she's doing, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, I mean, she's a, basically a religious entity. A prophet is a teacher, like we just said. But it's not of God. 
So, some people say, well, my church. My church would never, ever do something like this. Hmm. All right, well, let's, let's bring this specific to today. Hmm. What could we say is happening in churches that would fall unto this church of Thyatira? In other words, they've got good works, they have love, they've got, they, they got faith, they got patience. They got understanding of, of some of God's words. However, they're committing fornication or worshiping idols. Are there any churches today that do that? Absolutely. Without naming them, what are they doing? They would say, you know, it's okay if you want to have a couple wives, live with them. Uh, we'll go ahead and put up a little uh, figure on top of our roof or in the church and you go worship that figure and claim it to give special knowledge and special reverence. They have special um, powers. Yeah, or even... Um, you pray to that entity, entity. Mm -hmm. or that figure. Or mm -hmm. even go ahead and have us a nice uh, celebration in the springtime and go ahead and bring, bring in the ham that you sacrifice. Or the to. eggs. Or the eggs. Or the eggs. So, without naming specific and naming them all, and pointing fingers and this and that, there are plenty that goes on that so, qualifies. So, <clears throat> you're right. I mean, you're 100% correct. We, we've got churches today. All right, let's, let's just take one. Which, one thing that basically almost all churches in the world today do is worship Easter. Now Easter to them is the highest of all holiest of days. But the fact of the matter is if you take Easter back to its prime root word, you can take, just forget about the Bible just for a minute. Take the word Easter in the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 4th edition or earlier, because they dropped it after that. Mm -hmm. Or change the definition. Change it to Oster for German. Yeah. Instead of Easter. And and you learn that it's a, a queen of heaven. Mm -hmm. So how can the queen of heaven become the highest of all holiest of days? Because the church of that time frame changed it. Changed Passover to Easter. And forget the reason why. I mean, the reason why is obvious. They wanted more people to come into the church. But the thing is, when you, when you change something in our Father's Word to fit your own agenda, what are you actually doing? What takes place? You're bringing sin into the church. You say, well, it's not sin. I worship Christ. How can you worship somebody who says, I don't want any part of this? How can you worship somebody on, on rapture theory when Christ says, I'm against it? I'm against those who teach my children fly to save their soul in Ezekiel 13, 20. See, the point being is our Father gives us a road map. He gives us an instruction booklet. That's what this is. It's an instruction booklet of what he likes and what he doesn't like. And the fact is, if you go against what he hates, what he doesn't like, how in the world can you receive blessings? Let's see, a lot of people say, oh, that's not what I'm doing. The Lord knows my heart, right? Mm -hmm. The Lord knows that, that I'm worshiping him. In other words... They're saying, I know more than my father does. Because I'm going to worship him how I want to, not how he wants me to. That's what it comes down to. Oh, no, you don't understand. No, I understand perfectly. You're picking and choosing what you want to do. How you want to do it. Now, here's the thing with the white stone. Let's say you didn't have proper instruction. You didn't have information. 
However, you decided to study the Word of God for yourself. To go in there and really dig out the words and understand, you know, when it says Jezebel, you just don't take the name. You, you do the research. You look back at Jezebel. You see what she did and all those things. And you put all the pieces together. You put the pieces together between Easter and Passover. And you put it all together and you come to realize, hey, what I did do, what I did know, was wrong. Because my father says it's wrong. Now at that point, you can be an overcomer. Meaning you can overcome the way you used to be, the way you used to think, or you remain who and what you are at the time. But that's not being an overcomer. But if you do overcome, our Lord has said, I'm going to give you a white stone. I'm going to give you a passing grade. Even more so, I'm going to give you blessings for the rest of your days. Now, when you put it that way, people say, oh, that's what I want. Well, then let go and let God. Quit hanging on to the hang-ups of the world and what the world's traditions have established in your life and start living living things God's way. And that's what he's talking about here. Verse 21. Here it is. I gave her space. <laughs> I don't need to laugh at that. But I gave her space to repent of her fornication. What is he saying here? Look, she was screwing up. She was whoring around. She was pulling away my children from truth. But you know what? I gave her space to fall on her face. I gave her space to make all these mistakes. But here it is. And she repented not. In other words, what, what is our Lord saying? He's saying, look, I know you don't have the proper information from the beginning. And I have patience. I have long-suffering. And I'm going to teach you. All you have to do is come to me, study my word, and I will teach you. However, it's up to you to repent of your old ways. I'm not going to force you to do it. It's up to you. It's between you and the Lord at that point. Now, if you come to the realization, if you're given this information, and you don't repent... What's he going to do? He's going to remove that candlestick at here's, that point. Here's, here's the key. Because I was raised this way, we didn't use the word repent. We used confess. Meaning that you would tell someone the things that you had done wrong. and you Tell promised, a man. You promised not to do it anymore and you had penance to do. But the thing of it is, is you need to note that true repentance is that you don't do that thing or those things anymore. That's right. Not, you're going to try not to do it. And that's what it comes down to sometimes. It's kind of like the trial and error thing because it's hard to change old ways. Well, see, that's where Christ says he's the heart knower. And he's patient. <laughs> but, all right, let, since Donna brings it up, let's let's say we have something that's that's we're doing wrong in life. Whatever it may be. We may not think it's wrong. No, no, no. But according no, to the no, word. No, no, no. Okay. Let's say we come to the realization in our life mm -hmm. that whatever it is, that what we're doing is wrong in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And we say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be that way. Whatever, whatever the, the sin is, the weakness is, we say, I don't want to do that anymore. And then, <laughs> it could be the same day or a week later, a month later, whatever the case may be, we do it again. Did we, were we honest with the Lord? Did we repent? Or did we not repent? Because that's what you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. you're saying repent, and I understand what you're we saying. We fell short of that repentance. All right. All right, we fell short. So does you. that mean when we first repented that we didn't want to do it again? Mm -hmm. That it wasn't true repentance? No. But the thing of it is, is you have to strive to overcome that. And if you feel that it's too big a thing 
for your puny human flesh to handle, you have to take it to the Lord and ask Him for help. Okay. And that's the There's only way it's the happen. key. The fact of the matter is, if we repent in life, um, what it, I don't care what it is, and we fall short of that. Continuously sometimes. Continuously. Whatever the case may be, we've got to go to the Lord with this. Because he already knows we don't have the strength. But see, when he says in verse 17, to him that overcometh, what does that mean? That also means you overcome the weakness. If you repent and you're weak and you fail, you need to learn how to overcome it. And learning how to overcome doesn't necessarily mean only you. That means you and our Father. With His help, with His power, and His authority. See, that shows Him your faith. I mean, how strong is that faith? Because that's what it comes down to, your faith. And whether or not you truly believe that He can help you. I mean, I know there have been things in the past that before we were given certain knowledge and understanding of things that we may have fudged, walked that middle line on. And I can't speak for your prayer at those times, but I know my prayer was that if it is truly wrong, whether I could find it in here or not, for God to either lead me and to where it was you. in, in or, or, yeah, to give me that, that knowledge and that ability to know that it was. Well, see, that's why it says here in verse 22, Behold, uh, no, excuse me, 21, And I gave her space to repent. Mm -hmm. Space to repent means that he doesn't necessarily think that you're going to repent and boom, it's done with. He knows that we're weak and we're going to fail. Oh, yeah. However, when he draws that line, mm -hmm. you don't cross it. Now, what that line is, that's between you and him. That's an individual basis. Yeah, I know there's been times that I've said, I'm God, I'm not, I'm not God, because with my patience and, and, and sometimes I would just, you know, done. True. Let's continue. I'm running out of time. Verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her. Remember, she was a prophetess in her own doing, which means she was a teacher. So that means that people were following her teachings. It's the same people like today who are following the teachings of Easter, who are following the teachers of, of, of Christmas at the wrong time, following the teachings of um, flyaway doctrine. You know, they're going to have to pay for their own sins. That commit adultery with her into great tribulation. They're going to have great trouble. Except they repent of their deeds. If they do not repent of their deeds, they're going to have all this knowledge and all this covering, all this blessings removed from their life. Just like what we talked about a few weeks ago where they have holes in their baskets. They're working really hard. But the fact is, they can't save no money. You know, they're blowing it. Among other things. Verse 23. 23. And I will kill her children with death. Now what does that mean? The Lord's just going to blot them out? Who's death? Satan. Satan's death. So basically, what is he saying? I will kill her children with death means that they're going to be spiritually deader than a hammer. They're not going to understand anything that God brings forth in his word. The word will be right before them. That's why when you talk to some people and you give them a biblical truth, they look at you like you're from Mars. Some people. Not all. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. Father looks into our hearts and into our minds. He's searching to see those that will follow him and those that will not and I will give unto every one of you according to your works 
not the works of a preacher, not the works of a parent, not the works of a child, but your own works. You, in other words, you will get what you got coming by what you have done or have not done. And that's important to understand because our Father is not going to require this person over here who's a milk Christian to do exactly to produce the same as a meat Christian because they're not the same. They're on different levels. However, he will bless them both by doing what's right on their level. And he's not going to expect any more of them at that point. It says that in a couple of verses. Sure it does. 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, mm -hmm. as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put I will put upon you none other burden. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. That's what he's talking about here. He's not he, he's only going to require from you what you're capable of receiving. Now what does that mean? What do I mean by that? Some people are not willing to let go and let God. They, now, just like these other churches, they love Jesus. They believe in, in Jesus. They believe in his death and resurrection. They believe they have eternal life. They believe all these wonderful things. They go out and they help people. They're, they're, they're patient. They're kind. They're loving but the thing is, they, they take some things of our Father's Word and twist it and turn it because that's what they've been taught and that's what they're following. And then they go out and tell others of, of some of these false doctrines. And, and they're causing some people to remain in darkness instead of coming into light, coming into that truth. And... In other words, if you get out of Satan's bed and begin to try and walk the right path and you haven't gone to the depths of Satan's little tricks that he works into Christianity, he says, I won't put any, anything else on you. And there are other false religion practices that can fall very easily into this church of Thyatira. You don't have to know the book of like you don't have to know the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. That's false doctrine. It's false doctrine. I mean, God. We know we've studied in Ezekiel 13:20 that God is against those who teach His children to fly to save their soul. But how many churches today teach every week that at any moment Jesus can come? At any moment. Well, if he can come at any moment, what are they really saying to, to those of us that have understanding? What are they truly saying? That any moment, I want you to worship the first entity who appears. And we know the first entity who is, appears is not Jesus Christ, but the Antichrist. It also means that all the warning signs and all the steps that were, you know, he told us about ain't true. What do you mean? I mean, those that teach that doctrine are saying that oh, the yes. book of Revelation is just false. There's yes. nothing there. It, yes. does, it ain't going to happen just like that. Well, if, if, if they teach a flyaway doctrine and God says, I'm against it, yeah. I don't need more, more to fall on me about that. Yeah. If God says, I'm against it, why in the world would I want to teach it? I don't care who said it. Why would I want to teach it if God says, I am against it? Or in 2 Thessalonians, they very clearly gives us a line by line of the circumstances that have to take place before Jesus Christ returns. Yeah. You either believe it or you don't. But see, it's clear to those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. Yeah. It's not clear to those who don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, see, here's the thing. Christ wants all people to have eyes to see and ears to hear. That's why he's teaching it. That's why he said the things that he's saying. So people can learn this and overcome. 
Verse 25 says, But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Look, what you know, what you understand, hang on to that. And don't let anybody come around and try to sway you from it. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't learn more in-depth understanding, but it's not going to be man that teaches us that. It will be our Father in His Word. It won't contradict the Word. It will never contradict the Word. Never, ever. You know, that always has, has kind of really got me when people have said, well, the, the Bible is contradictory. Well, no, your understanding of the Bible is contradictory. That means you haven't been able to study it at the depth in which, in which our Father has brought it forth. And you're trying to pick and choose what you want to study and learn. Now, most of those people have looked at it and they found one or two little things in there they didn't look contradictory. Oh, well, I'm just going to put that away. I'm yeah, it kind of there. reminds me of uh, where I flea market years mm -hmm. ago. And um, we're out there handing out literature and this and that and the other. And there was this one guy that... Uh, studied, according to him, he studied with Dr. Arnold Murray. And uh, to which I thought, well, hey, we're, we're going to have some good conversations here. To which we did. But uh, I remember him saying, well, I don't really watch him anymore. And I go, really? I said, why? He says, well, he contradicts himself and he won't answer questions. And I wasn't going to touch the contradictory part because, you know, it's too open book, too open thing to, to get into. But I asked him, well, what do you mean by him not ask, answering questions? He says, well, I, I watched it several times and uh, somebody would write in, ask a question, he'd start to answer it, and then he'd go off left field and talk about something else. I couldn't, I couldn't argue with that because that's how Arnold Murray taught. Arnold Murray taught he, he would go to answer a question, but sometimes I guess the Holy Spirit would move in him to, to, to talk about almost something else. That's who he was. But I wasn't going to throw him out in all of his teachings because that's the way he answered some questions. Because to me, he was a Bible scholar, and he could really teach in depth. On, on his word. He just wasn't perfect. But he wasn't perfect. <laughs> okay. You know, and... Uh, Welcome to the court. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Here's your pass. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's telling us in verse 25 here, and i got to move on, but he's telling us in verse 25, hold fast to what you know. Right. The good stuff. And then, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to build on that. Right. Just like build a house. I'm going to build your foundation first... And then I'm put put the walls up, and then the ceiling, and then the roof, you know, and all this stuff. I'll, I'll frame it, and then I'll build on that. 27. 26. No, 26. And he, here it is again, and he that overcometh and keepeth or maintains my works. Well, what, what's his works? Those works that he's done which he showed us to do unto what? Wouldn't that be his word as well? Of course it would be. Unto when? The end. The end of what? Time. <laughs> Our time here on earth. Oh, we're not supposed to keep his, his word after the millennial period? Well, no, I'm not saying that. It's the end of time then. Forever. I think it's forever. forever. Kind of like what it says. No. <laughs> to him will I give power over the nations. Now what's the nations? Normally speaking. United Nations? No, not the United Nations. It's ethnos. It means the... Uh, yeah. eth eth actually it means ethnic peoples. Mankind. Mankind. What, what do you mean he's going to give you power over them? Why is he giving... Well, if the ethnos are basically part of the world, and you're not of the world... And you want to overcome it. And you overcome it, you will learn how to overcome it, which means you will be given power over it. Just like today, when stuff happens today, 
we don't come to pieces. We don't fall apart because of, of what the politicians. We don't come. We don't come apart because so and so didn't get elected. We don't come apart because this nation is 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 bad mouth in this nation. You know, because we know it's all basically part of the world and its system, and it doesn't really affect us. You say, well, how can it not affect you? I mean, we've got gas prices, you've got food prices, just like everybody else. Let me tell you something. It does not affect God's elect like it does the world. We may still have to deal with it. You've got to deal with it, but instead of having holes in your basket, you don't. That's why you can go to the grocery store on $40 less a week and get as much groceries as you used to get, if not as much good quality food. How can you? You say, well, that's impossible. Not with God, it isn't. <laughs> because God provides. How many times have you told me, well, I went over here to get this and it was on sale? <laughs> wasn't on sale before, it's on sale today. <laughs> well, well, what, just for you? No. <laughs> but it provided for you. <laughs> you know, and all these things. You know, you have your transmission go out in your car. Oh, that's a big expense. Did it get fixed? Absolutely. Why? Well, I did this and I did that. No, God gave you the power and the authority to be able to be able to do these things. The opportunity was right there. Was right there. Yeah. They said to work for it. <laughs> it's like everything. And sometimes along the way, if we if we're not getting it, what does He teach us along the way? Patience. Faith. To have that faith, that unshakable faith. That he is in charge, he's the one in control, and he will be uh, he will be the one that makes it all right. Because after all, that's who he is. He wants the best for his children, and we're his children. Twenty-seven, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He's when when Christ returns, he's not coming back as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's coming with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Those that are not doing what is right, they will be broken in pieces. Even as I received of my Father. <laughs> 28. And I will give him the morning star. That's interesting. The morning star is Christ, of course. But those that have overcome and studied our Father's Word, we've learned uh, what Morning Star, going back to the beginning, also meant. The word Lucifer also means Morning Star. Well, then why why is Christ called Morning Star? Because Lucifer has always been a deceiver, and he's he's always tried. And wanted to play the role of Christ. And he's chosen names. And he's picked names. For people to be deceived. But what, what God is promising you in the book of Re Revelation. I will be the true morning star. And you won't be following that fake one. Verse 29. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. And the question is, do you have an ear? Do you have an ear to understand what he's telling these churches? And you're not going to have an ear unless, you, like the very first verse said, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. If you are not serving the Lord, you are not going to have eyes to see nor ears to hear. Because if you're not serving him, and I don't mean to be perfect. I mean that you're really trying to serve him in whatever capacity you are living in. Trying to serve him. whatever You can serve him whether you're a mother, whether you're a father, whether you're a sister, whether you're a brother. You can serve him in whatever capacity you're in. And if you're trying your best, you will overcome. And that's his promise to us. Well, that's the end of the chapter. Any questions? We got to understand these these churches are for the peoples of this earth today. His servants to know and understand. Hey, 
None of us are perfect. But we can learn how to overcome and to do things the right way. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for your word that is before us. We thank you for revealing to us and passing unto us how to overcome and how to look for those things that are right and how to look for those and uh, remove from us those things that are wrong. And it is up to us. You have given us a clear course to follow, but it is up to us to follow. And we will always follow you and, and, and rely on you and trust you. I pray for everyone here today and their families and all those on YouTube that you watch over all, that you lead, guide, and direct. And forevermore we will give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory.